Good morning, and welcome to the Prairie Plains Church of Christ lesson for June the 5th of 2022. A lady stated that she had four kids under five years old running around the house, running wild in spite of her repeated exhortations to slow down and lower their voices. All of them came to a shrieking halt, not hardly. They all come running and screaming and so forth into the kitchen, and she slammed her hand on the kitchen table and shouted, What is wrong with y'all? Were you born in a barn? How many times have we heard that statement? And she went on to say that her four-year-old looked up at her, flashed a thousand-watt smile, and sweetly said, No, but Jesus was. And he turned out, Okay, how can you keep from smiling? with a reply like that. Jesus was, and he turned out okay. Our text today is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 46. If you take your Bibles and turn to that particular chapter and read with me, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. While Jesus may have been born in a barn, what do we think of the Christ? What do we think of Jesus? <coughs> Excuse me. Who do we, Christians, Children of God claim Jesus is. Who is he? The question was asked to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. And if he asked his disciples this question, should we not ask ourselves the same question? When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But notice the question that is put forth that we are asking today. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we were asked these questions, what would be our reply? Well, we may answer the Son of God or the Son of the living God. We may answer the question, He is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. We may answer, well, He's the high priest, our prophet. He's our priest. He's our king. He's our intercessor. He's our mediator. He is our advocate. And the list goes on and on. Many more things we could name. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, prince of peace, Emmanuel. And the list goes on. I want to take a few minutes in this lesson and look at this question, which is asked in Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said unto him, The son of David. Did you notice their answer? 
the son of David. Jesus was the son of David according to the flesh. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Which was made of the seed of David. And according to the flesh. Born of the seed of David. According to the flesh. As we look at Matthew chapter 16 verse 13. His mother was human. Therefore, he is referred to as the Son of Man. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Yet at the same time, not only was he the Son of Man, he had a dual nature. He was God. As we see in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Then in verse 14, it stated, And the Word became flesh. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. Jesus was the Son of Man as the result of being born of flesh, Mary. But yet at the same time, he was God in the flesh. God incarnate, as we see in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Their declaration that Jesus is the son of David is on target. Absolutely correct. As we see in verses 43 through 45. But that was part of the truth. But not all the truth. In their minds, they limited Jesus to being the son of David. It's a great answer. But it's not enough. It's inadequate. Christ proved That in his reply to the answer in verses 43 through 45, he proves that it wasn't adequate. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? You combine the three Gospels, we have a powerful declaration and affirmation to what Jesus was claiming. He was the Son of God. He was the Son of David. The the astonishing fact is that the great King David refers to someone as being his superior. He called him Lord. Speaking as one of the people, he lays down his crown at the feet of another, a greater king, at God's right hand. And yet this psalm is my signing concerning the son of David. It brings in the question, how can anyone at the same time be both inferior to another as his descendant, and on par with God as his Lord, being both king and subject? Good question, isn't it? Inspired by the Holy Spirit is what we see in these verses also in Matthew 22. David claimed inspiration. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said. And then we have the example found in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 30. Many brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is alive us, is alive. Sephir is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet 
and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Notice that God sworn with an oath to David. And also in this text, it says, in the book of Psalms. The Hebrews had high regards, high respect, and love for David. They recognized he was a man inspired by the Spirit. God spoke to him. And David is the author of the book of Psalms. They could not argue the Masonic nature of this particular psalm. I want you to look at their response. Matthew 22, verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more. God acknowledged Jesus as his son. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened up unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then at the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transfigured in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5, Peter wanted to build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus, putting on the equality, putting on par with one another. And listen to what was heard. And behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Jesus was superior to Elijah and to Moses. But notice, God referred to Jesus as being his son. The disciples of Jesus acknowledged Jesus as God's son also. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Then in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. Yes, the disciples recognized Jesus as the Son of God. And in fact, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto Peter, but the heavenly Father of Jesus did. The teachings of Jesus testified to him being defined also. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, for Jesus taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In John chapter 7, verses 45 through 46, then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Yes, the teaching of Jesus showed that he was someone greater than all the other teachers, that he was the Son of God. The knowledge of knowing what was in man was proof he was not just a man. In John chapter 2, verses 24 through 25, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Then in John chapter 4, verse 28 and 29, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the Messiah? Is that not this? As we look at all these things, the son of David, the son of God, look at his teachings, look at the knowledge 
that he had. And then the works of Christ gave proof who Jesus was. Miracles by themselves supported the claim of Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus had power over nature. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep, and his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. Remember, these are professional fishermen. It's not like Billy being out of lake and a tornado hits. These guys are professional. If they're scared out in that sea when a storm arises, it is dangerous. They are afraid they are going to perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the waves, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea? By him. Jesus had authority over disease, as we'll see in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant, lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant. Do this, and doeth it. And he does. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I am not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the safe same hour. Yes, Jesus had control, authority over nature, power, authority over disease. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, Behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Notice, when you study the healing of people in the Bible, the healing was immediate. It wasn't an hour. It wasn't days. It wasn't weeks. It wasn't years afterwards. It was completely healed immediately. He had power over disease. He also had power over death. Death was in submission to him. You have the widow's son at Nain, Luke 7. You have Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. And then you have his friend Lazarus who had died and been in the grave for three days. And in verses 43 through 44 of John 11, it says, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. And by the way, that's John 11 instead of Luke. Now that we have learned and reaffirmed that Jesus is God's son, the question changes a little bit. The question now becomes, what will you do with Christ? 
what will I do with Christ? I want us to examine the decision of some in the Bible and see if it corresponds to my decision, your decision, our decision. The first one are the Jews. They wanted to crucify Jesus Christ. And they did. In Matthew 27, verse 22 and verse 23, Pilate said unto them, What shall I do to them with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto them, and to him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. That's what the Jews wanted to be done to Jesus. Imagine today, if a man started to gain popularity, who challenged much of what was considered to be conventional religion, Proclaimed that he and God were one in the same. Challenged some of most well-known religious authorities. Stated that he existed from eternity. Always existed. Spoke about how his body and blood were being consumed when one partook of unleavened bread and the fruit of his vine. I'm guessing that as you are reading this list, you are probably saying, yeah, I don't think I would receive such a person too well either. Think about that for me. Would we crucify Jesus? I want you to know that something the Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance. And people state that we can't fall away. What does the text say? Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Here are people who were Christians. They were once enlightened they had tasted of the heavenly gift. They partook of the Holy Spirit. They experienced the good word of God. They partook of the powers of the world to come. Yet they made a conscious choice to refuse these things, to forsake Christ, and to go back into Judaism. The Hebrew writer says that it is impossible to renew them again into repentance. Why? Because Judaism could not justify anyone. It's only the blood of Christ. The Hebrew writer had just admonished these Christians for not growing and not maturing in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. They had left Christ. Growth meant nothing to them. They had gone out. They had gone on. They had not gone on to perfection. Chapter six, verse one. They're living the way they want to. No regard for the word. They are continuing to crucify Christ again, 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 and again by the way they live. Is this describing us? Does it describe me? Does it describe you? Then we come to Judas in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went into the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. He sold Jesus out. What would it take for us to sell Jesus? A new job? A new career? Would we sell out for that? To become unfaithful? In attendance? To become unfaithful? 
in the way that we live and conduct our lives? Would it be to have that mate that you have your eyes on knowing the kind of ungodly life he or she lives and will draw you away from the Lord? What about having an affair on the side? You see, we're selling Jesus out. We're selling Jesus in these areas. And we could list many more. In Matthew 27, I want you to notice something about Judas. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, sold him out. When he saw that, that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Are we going to crucify Jesus today? What are we going to do with him? Are we going to sell Jesus today? What are we going to do with him? Are we going to do what Peter did? Are we going to deny Jesus? In Matthew 26, verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Oh, he was so positive that he never would. But in Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75, three times. Three times he denied Jesus. I don't know the man. Don't know him. And then it, the text says, Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Am I going to deny like Peter did? Or are you going to deny like Peter did? What are we going to do with Jesus? We're either going to crucify him, sell him, deny him. What we do with, with Jesus? Are we going to forsake him like all the disciples did? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And in verse 56 of Matthew 26, then all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. Will we forsake him? What about Pilate? In Matthew 27, verse 24, Pilate remained neutral. Saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And Pilate wanted to remain neutral in this life, making a decision concerning Jesus. Are we waiting and going to be neutral when someone attacks the faith? Or are we going to contend for the faith? Maybe we're not a child of God. Are we going to remain neutral and not verbally? Confess Jesus is Lord. Hmm. Good question, isn't it? What about Felix? Who wanted to postpone everything? After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. Right now, the question is, what will I do 
with Jesus. Will we crucify him? Will we sell him? Will we deny him, forsake him, be neutral, postpone our decision to obey the gospel? Or will we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? For you see, one day the question is going to change. It, the question is going to be, what will Christ do with me? For in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it states, For we must all appear before the judgment seat. Of Christ. Is he going to, are we going to hear the words, depart from me? I never knew you. Or are we going to hear the words, come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Is that what we're going to hear? For you see, we have examples of people who obeyed and didn't obey, who denied, who crucified, who procrastinated in obeying the gospel. We have the same thing happening today. Same thing is happening right here. The people listening to this broadcast today you're doing one of these things that these men and women did that we just read about. We have all the evidence. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. And the Bible proves who he is. Is he Lord and Savior today in your life? Do you believe that he is the son of God? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess it before others? So Jesus will confess you before the father in heaven. Will you be immersed in water for the remission of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Acts 2.38. I pray that you will. I pray that you will. The question I leave with you today is what are you doing with Jesus Christ in your life? For that question will change 180 degrees. For the question will be one day is what will Christ do with me and with you? Thank you for allowing me to share this message with you from the Word of God. Let's continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ.